Hello and welcome to the Collective Spotlight. Today we have an awesome indie double feature with two amazing creators, two amazing books, and uh, they both kind of very different publishers, very different styles, but they're both um, at their core superhero books. Um, without any further ado, for this episode of Collective Spotlight, I'm going to bring out our first guest, which is Stony Williams, the writer of Mad Cave Comics Villainous, number one, which will actually be hitting shelves tomorrow. And here he is, Mr. Stony Williams himself. How are you doing, Stony? Good. How are you? I am good, man. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you are now officially, I believe, our third Mad Cave guy. And all three have been uh, talent search winners. So congratulations. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. So um, before I get into the book, let me um, preface with mentioning that you were a 2019 uh, talent search winner. Is that correct? Uh, 2018. 2018. So you were the 2018 talent search winner. Um, tell the people a little bit about what that process with the talent search with Mad Cave is like. And I mean, you said you entered in 2018. This book is hitting shelves almost the end of 2020, what has that process been like for you? So um, I actually ran a, a podcast and blog myself reviewing comic books, and that's how I discovered Mad Cave and their talent hunt. Um, I had entered one other talent hunt a couple of years before for Top Cow, uh, Top Cow um, and uh, obviously I didn't win that one. But um, I, I uh, decided to try my hand at Mad Caves, and uh, it was a late entry, and... Um, uh, a couple of weeks later, I got an email saying I won, and uh, it has been a, a wild ride. We had some um, hiccups, some scheduling conflicts with artists in the beginning, which is why my I book came out so much later. And then the pandemic hit, which pushed it back even further. Okay. So, but Mad Cube's been amazing. I mean, everybody, everybody there has been uh, so welcoming and, and definitely makes you feel part of the family. And uh, getting to know some of the other talent hunt winners, I've, I've made some incredible friends and, and relationships that, that uh, really mean a lot to me over the last couple of years. That, that is absolutely awesome. So you mentioned that you were a 2018 talent search winner. Mm -hmm. um, is that the same talent search that had David Galliano winning as well? Yeah, David, uh, Anthony Cleveland, and uh, Jay Sandlin. And okay, awesome, did. yeah. So we have three of your guys' books. Um, actually, uh, David is coming for a signing in two weeks for the Trade awesome. Savage Bastard. So it's just kind of crazy that you guys all won at the same time. And mm -hmm. because of different reasonings and the pandemic and shipping, you know, one of them is kind of at the trade. And then the other one, you're literally uh, hitting issue number one on shelves tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been pretty wild. And uh, yeah, uh, David's a great guy. You'll have a lot of fun with him. Oh yeah, he's he's awesome. Um, so like I said, you got number. It, it feels like it's been a long time coming. So what does it feel like that this is going to hit the shelves tomorrow? Finally, like surreal. Like I don't think it'll it'll really hit me until I've got it in my hands and it's, I see it on shelves. You know, it's um, we we've had. I mean, it's been pushed back, um, uh, and and with the pandemic, and it put, got pushed back further, and um, so. It, it like I said, it's been surreal. You almost get the feeling like maybe it's never going to happen. Like it was just one big prank. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, here it is. You know, I mean, I've 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 got the digital stuff. I've I've seen uh, Jeff's artwork, and and I'm just so excited and so anxious for this book to finally hit shelves and, and to see what everybody thinks about it. And and not just uh, issue one, which I've been talking about for a while now, but the subsequent issues and how people feel about the series overall. I'm really excited for people to get their hands on this. So. Yeah, and it's funny because like I'm over here booking you for to talk about issue one, and your Twitter Twitter bio is like pre-order issue three. So it's like you're you're definitely a, a ahead of the game. Um, we th thankfully, you know, um, it is you know we got our books early because Mad Cave hooked us up. We ordered directly from them. They sent them to us early. So I've had a chance to read it now, in you know physical copy and everything. But um, tell the fans a little bit what the story of Villainous is. It is somewhat a superhero tale, but give them give them that uh, you can do much longer than elevator pitch. Don't feel rushed here. Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it follows uh, superhero Tilly as she uh, uh, starts off with her apprenticeship with the premier superhero team uh, of their world. And she gets paired up with one of her favorite superheroes as, as his sidekick, Superhero Showdown. Um, kind of sort of um, the the 
a Superman type. Okay. For the, the you know the the heavy hitter yeah. for the coalition of heroes. Um, and she quickly learns that the life of being a sidekick isn't quite as glamorous as she expected. <laughs> yeah, um, she does. And uh, then she finds out some things she wasn't meant to hear, and it kind of snowballs for her from there. She she has to make a choice as to uh, you know fall in line with the people that she's idolized or stick to her morals and, and what she feels superheroes are supposed to be. And then as, as things build and, and snowball for her, uh, it just gets worse and worse from there. So <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Absolutely. So Tilly is our main character then, correct? We feature mm -hmm. her here on the cover. Um, Rep Tilly, I believe is her, her superhero name. That's right. And tell us a little bit about Rep Tilly and um, what her, I feel like um, from my reading early on, and you might need to read into some of the word bubbles, but it seems like she is not liked because of her species, something like that. Is that correct? Sure. She she's not one of the uh, uh, you know beautiful superheroes. She doesn't fit in that uh, that box that that a lot of people think of when they think of of classic superheroes. And so uh, she she's get, gets labeled like a freak a lot, but she's she's optimistic and hopeful and a bit naive about the world she's walking into but she definitely feels like this is her chance to take all of the things that have set her apart and make her different and, and give them a purpose and a reason for them and so it, it's one of the things that makes her so excited to finally become a superhero and get in the middle of this so awesome awesome so um in the first issue you know we re we learn a lot about her we learn about a lot about showdown um, we learned a little bit about the Coalition of Superheroes. Tell us about the supporting cast in this book. Um, you know, we've got the Coalition of Superheroes with Showdown. We also have, is it Parcel, right? The, uh, pillar. Uh, pillar, pillar. Pillar. Yeah. So um, tell us about that that supporting cast. And we actually, in the first issue, don't get to see too, too much of the villains. How much are they going to play a role in? Uh, the villains play a pretty big role moving forward. Um uh, without trying to give too much away, yeah. uh, obviously uh, the the title uh, alludes to some uh, pretty major um, uh, villain action yeah. throughout yeah. this this series. Um, you know the leader leader of the coalition, Pillar, and then you've also got Showdown. Like I said, they're heavy hitter. Yeah. Uh, Pillar comes across more of like um, the uh, high tech whiz. She tries to to be the manager and oversee things, yeah. and uh, she'd rather not be out in the field unless she absolutely has to be. Um, then you've got Miss Nemesis, which is one of the newer uh, upper echelon of, of, of the heroes. Uh, she's their resident speedster. Um, not Everybody's time got to have a speedster, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> not time traveling fast, but uh, uh, faster than normal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you do get a, a small glimpse of the villains uh, throughout issue one. Um, uh, um, they are. Um, set up as this world's terrorist organization yes. uh, the ones that are, are specifically going against the coalition and trying to take down everything they're trying to build yeah and that's the shadow order correct and you correct. Get, yes. we get a look at about two or three of them mm -hmm. here early on in the book um talk to me a little bit about i mean so when people think independent books they don't necessarily think superhero books um and you're kind of getting a chance to do both what what talk to me about that yeah, so uh, it's funny, uh, looking into getting into comic books, I, I saw over and over and over again, don't do superheroes. It's it's a cornered market, you'll never have the next Spider-Man, you'll never have the next Superman, don't bother with superheroes. Uh, but one of the ideas that Mad Keith had when, when I won was a superhero comic book. And growing up in the late 80s and early 90s, I mean, superheroes permeated everything I did. Yeah. Uh, I was raised in the back of a comic book store. So, like, I mean, superheroes have been there since I, since for as long as I can remember, right? <laughs> and so, even though I had never had any idea to do a superhero book, I completely put it out of my mind. I thought, you know, maybe I could do something with this. If it, Mad Keith presented a unique opportunity where I could really make it my own, and we could take this uh, genre and these tropes that we know and we love and people are familiar with, and do anything we wanted with them, and twist them around, and flip them on their heads, and and uh, uh, really make it my own. And so I thought, you know, if if I take these things that I love and I can kind of look at them with a satirical eye for the things that we don't always love and things that don't always work with superheroes, but then also celebrate the things we do. And uh, as, as 
uh, dark as some of the themes are for this book and, and some of the, the trouble Tilly gets into, uh, humor had to play a big part in, in this book. And I think that that's part of what uh, Jeff brings to it. Uh, even the, the heavier parts of the book, he, he brings a lot of, uh, of uh, humor to these characters and there's with the facial expression, especially yeah. Tilly. Yeah. I love every every panel she's in. Um, Jeff really brings the book to life and your, your colorist as well, because your colorist really, really did a good job on this. Um, you know, I mean, we're just at issue one mm -hmm. and I'm already really excited. You know, I, I was literally flipping through it as, right before you came on. Um, and I really can't wait to just finish the last couple of pages once I, I get off. But um, so uh, another cool thing I noticed about the book is the covers for the, at least I believe three of them have been solicited so far, kind of feature a different character on the cover. Um, are we going to get on those issues? Are we going to get deeper into those characters? Or is that kind of just your guys' way of introducing those characters to everybody via the cover? Yeah, it doesn't really allude to uh, focuses on those characters from okay. those covers. Yeah. Okay, because, yeah, I was wondering that, and I said, okay, are we going to meet a bunch of... Because, you know, the first issue clearly has Tilly, so I was Obviously, like, okay, yeah. the main character and everything like that. But I do like how you guys keep a pattern there, then. Absolutely, and it looks great. I've seen all five of them up there together, and it, it looks great, one right after, one right after the other. Um, I guess, you know, um, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, um, in a roundabout way, the, the characters do kind of feature more of them with those covers it wasn't intentional but now that i'm thinking about the <laughs> issues i guess those characters really do uh stand out a bit more with those subsequent issues um that was not intentional at all but now that you said that i think it that's the that way, way that works come to but, it, but yeah. tilly will be the uh, main character throughout all yes it is all. very much tilly's story in her arc and uh i'm really excited to see uh, people's reactions about where we take her and the things that she goes through and where she ends up that's awesome so uh, is the plan for, is this a five issue mini series? Is that the way this is laid out? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So far five issues. And I like I, I like things that end, you know, I like, yeah. uh, to, to wrap things up well, but I like to think that while I gave people a ending, they can be satisfied with, we've left enough things open that we could continue this on. If we wanted to, we could expand not only on the characters, but the world itself. Yeah. So, uh, I, I do, I do hope. Uh, that I, I gave a satisfying <laughs> ending and, and wrapped the story up well, but um, I, I, there is definitely more to this. So. so if Mad Cave asked you to come come on back and you know do a volume two of Villainous, you'd be right on board. Absolutely. Because <laughs> that's one thing I noticed. Uh, Mad Cave has done this. Um, AWA has done this. I believe Scout has done this. Um, they make their mini series and they come, you know, when planned out, they do come to a conclusion. Um, but they always kind of leave that door open for what they call volume two or season two. And mm -hmm. you can always come back, whether it be those characters or something in that universe. And I think that's a great idea because people can fall in love with characters. And with so many comic books hitting the shelves these days, people don't want that relationship to only last five months. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think it's really smart. I mean, um, I love Marvel. I love DC. But with ongoing series, uh, there's a lot of problems that can happen there. You're switching off writers, especially, and, and uh, continuity issues. And the further and further you go, the more you run into that stuff. Yeah. But when you keep them in, in smaller contained volumes, um, I think it'd be easier to pass the torch and easier to tell stories that way. And it, you don't get that fatigue of, you know, I've been reading this for you know so many years yeah. now. And yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's smart to keep them in smaller contained stories and, and volumes like that. So uh, I also noticed that uh, Mad Cave, uh, when they announced their 2020 winners, they did a uh, like a web showcase. And during that web showcase, um, they announced a set of six, uh, I'm not going to call them New York Comic Con exclusives because they were their own thing. It was the, the Mad Cave at Home exclusives, mm -hmm. print runs of 50. Um, and your book was one of the ones chosen. You know, three of those books are Marks, and then mm -hmm. it was you, Stargazer, and Terminal Punks. What was it? What was that like to know that you were one of those three current books selected for that? Oh, it was insane. Like, um, obviously, uh, just being a freelance writer, I'm not as, as privy to the behind the scenes business stuff. So I, I get to find out about this stuff just usually just barely before anybody else does. Yeah. And so to see, like, I had no, I had, okay, so back in main on Mainframe Con, which was in August, I think. Time has no meaning anymore. <laughs> right. Um, it all a year ago, together. you know. Yeah, this entire year has just blended together. It's <laughs> just been one long week. Um, 
uh, Hal Laren uh, mentioned that he was doing a variant for my book, and I had no idea it was the first time I'd ever heard like even ideas that they were going to do variants for my book, and now uh, there's been three shown so far, and it is mind blowing to like. I mean, forget even having a book, but then a miniseries <laughs> that's got three, at least three so far variants for the first issue is just mind blowing to me. I mean, especially, like I said, as a kid in the 90s and superhero books were such a big thing and there were so many different kinds, and so many different covers that you could collect. And to have my book be even a small part of that is just insane. Absolutely, man. And, and the print runs, you know, sometimes we hear 100, sometimes we hear 250. These were printed 50. I mean, like the fans were going to get their hands on it and then that was going to be it. So, I mean, that was that that was really cool, you know, especially um, the fact that Mad Cave had the trust in you to put out a special cover for something before it actually hit shelves, because that was essentially two weeks before your book was hitting shelves. Yeah. So uh, uh, <laughs> I just there, there's there's no words, which is, is funny because as a writer, I can go on and on about things when this I just. I get so flabbergasted just thinking about this book and, and how lucky I've been with Mad Cave and the creative team. I mean, Jeff's artwork is just incredible. And it's one of those books, his, his art style is, is that, that you can read the book several times over and see different things yeah. throughout the story. I mean, just in the first few pages, I'd read it probably two or three times before I was going back over it again and went, wait a second. Is is he eating that guy in the back? <laughs> I think he's eating that guy. And yeah. I didn't catch it the first few times. So it's just one of those where so much detail and so much expression that you can read it over and over again and see different things every time. And I absolutely love it. I've been so incredibly lucky. And Joanna on the colors has been incredible. Yeah. Justin Birch on lettering is, is so good. He's doing so many Mad Key books now. No, yeah, but, your guys' um, creative team is phenomenal. Oh. And then really I need to ask you, um, be, first of all, being uh, a talent search winner, what was it like getting to work with Mark and the Mad Cave team in general? How, you know, how much, what was that like, you know, especially being a guy that wins a, like a, a contest like that, as opposed to getting, you know, uh, a contract of, of, in other ways? Yeah, so um, it, it was nerve wracking for one. Like I never even expected to win. And it was just kind of a... a uh, like it was what I was something I wanted and something I talked about a lot and so my wife was like you're not shutting up about this you need to quit talking and just just freaking do it just submit already and so but I was like there's no way I'm gonna win you know I've never I've never done anything professionally I, I have no idea what I'm doing and and so to get that email I, I probably <laughs> read it three times before I really <laughs> understood what was happening and the first uh, Skype meeting with uh, Mark and my editor Gio uh, was funny and probably something I'll never forget. Uh, it was just a, a kind of a general interview and they sat me down and we're talking about, you know, uh, things I was interested in and, and uh, what I expected and things. And I could barely get a word out. I was so nervous. I was <laughs> stammering and, and I just couldn't talk. I said, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm really nervous. And Mark said, take a breath, calm <laughs> down. You've already got the gig. The hard part's <laughs> over. <laughs> and it's it's just been so effortless over a lot of things uh, i mean even this with the scheduling conflicts with, with artists in the beginning uh mad key was just incredible they just handled it and uh i mean i, I can't say enough things about them the, both the chris's uh chris yeah. fernandez and chris sanchez uh, just incredible people manny's uh, awesome uh i'm just i can't tell you how much i adore my editor geo she is amazing she um Crafting this story with her has been an incredible experience. I really can't say enough nice, nice things about her. And Mark has been so approachable. And so, awesome. I mean, just couldn't have asked for a nicer experience and, and a nicer group of people. So. Nice. And, and Stoney, was this your first published work? Yeah, I I'd, uh, I'd signed on with Mad Cave uh, and I'd done, uh, I'd done some short story okay. uh, flash fiction with a group called Ashcan Comics Pub. Okay. And uh, but it was just prose, and uh, but yes, uh, after but and that came out before this did. But th I signed on and written this first. But this is my first published comics. Yeah, I had done a script for the Top Cow Talent Hunt. And I'd written one on my own after that, and then 
than the ones for the talent hunt. And that's all I'd written. Oh, wow. Awesome. So, so um, we, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but uh, I want to mention it again because in my conversations with David Galliano and in my conversations with Jared, who won, uh, I believe, in 2019 and has mm-hmm. dry foot out right now, I've heard so much about not just the family that is Mad Cave, but the family that was the talent search winners for every year. Um, what was that group of 2018 like, and, and what was that camaraderie like with you guys? Uh, you know, we have, uh, at least on my end, uh, I absolutely love these guys, every single one of them. Uh, and and uh, the the talent hunt in 2018, uh, I, 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 we've talked to those guys ever since, and, and we were all real close together. Uh, I love David. I love Jay. I love Anthony. Um, another art, uh, writer, Elias. Mm-hmm. Uh, a really cool guy and then 2019 came about and the, just another real great group of yeah. people came through and so we've actually got a uh, private uh, facebook group we're all a part of where we talk and, and pass things around and uh keep in touch that way and i i just like i said I, i've built these relationships and these friendships that i'll i really feel i'll probably have for the rest of my life they're just an amazing group of people amazing talent and so supportive of each other all of us just really willing to have each other's backs and, and help signal boost and and uh, uh if we have any problems you know we turn to each other for writing advice or you That's know awesome. uh, sometimes consoling each other when we don't <laughs> when things don't work out you know submission you get the submission rejections and you gotta uh pat each other on the back and push them back, back out there you know so but that's but like awesome. I said, great group of people i absolutely love them that's awesome it's like a brotherhood over there absolutely um so let me ask you uh five issues are you uh done writing them at this point are they just getting finished up like do you know how the story ends in your mind is it done i have the scripts are completely done actually they have been for a while um I have where we're getting art colored back for uh, issue five. I believe it's about to be lettered. So it's done. It's wrapped up. They're completing it. Um, I know how it ends. The background for my iPad is the last page of page Ooh. five. So <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like that. That's it. That's I know that that page must be great because it's it, because what you just it, told me like jaw dropping. Like, I, <laughs> like it, I mean, to for it to be mine but for it to impact me the way it did reading it and seeing it um like i i really i i hate to to toot my own horn but i I feel like that last page was was really it was great like what what a send-off what what a way to end this and wrap this up and uh like i i i've just i can't stop staring at it it's on the background for my ipad i've got it on my my computer like it's just in, insane and, and i love the colors and the art like i cannot wait for this boat to be on shelves that is awesome stony and the wait is almost over man we have them in hand i already know where i'm going to put them on the shelf i can't officially put them on the shelf until we close but um you know one last time first of all it's been awesome having you on a show tell everybody about the book one last time let them know about Villainous. Let them know about Tilly. And uh, just let them know, you know what they can expect for five issues here the next couple months. So, Rep Tilly, uh, uh, budding new sidekicks, fresh onto the uh, apprenticeship program for the Coalition of Heroes, uh, ready and eager to, to start her work as a superhero, learn some things she wasn't meant to hear, and uh, everything goes downhill from there for her and it becomes a, an issue of when your hero isn't as heroic as you think they might be who do you turn to and who, who do you go to yeah. and who do you who do you you know what authority is there over these uh, super powered people and the the option kind of gets taken out of her hands a little bit as being snowball for her and um, the arc that she goes on that where she ends up is uh, I think a twist on familiar tropes. I think that people will um, enjoy these. That people that love superheroes will enjoy these. People who've never read superhero books uh, could enjoy these and, and jump in. And I, I think that um, I, I hope people will be excited about where it goes and, and uh, the story that we've put together. And I honestly just cannot wait for people to dive into this. 
And uh, I want to remind people, because one thing, and, and I'm going to make sure my girlfriend reads this uh, tonight. She loves comics as well. But uh, strong female lead. And yeah, there are some stereotypes in the first couple of pages of the first issue, but Tilly clearly is not standing for them. And, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to spoil anything, but um, she is a strong, very strong female lead. Like when people ask about that type of stuff and they're looking for the Miss Marvels and, and things like that, I'll make sure to point them at Villainous. I appreciate that. There are some stereotypes that we set up that uh, uh, if I've done my job right, hopefully we knock those down a little bit. As the, I was just going to say, Tilly is ready to knock those things down. And even Absolutely. in the first issue, uh, she's not going to take it. So, <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much. The writer and the guest is Stoney Williams. The book is Villainous Number One. That will be on shelves tomorrow from Mad Cave Studios. We will have Villainous Number One along with the Mad Cave exclusive. I believe we ordered five copies for the store. So we will have awesome. them here in store if you didn't get a chance to grab them from Mad Cave. And make sure to add it to your sub if you end up liking it. It will be a five-issue miniseries from Mr. Stoney Williams. Stoney Williams. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Stoney Williams. <laughs> Take it easy, Stoney. You have a good one and best of luck with the book, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. So that was Stoney Williams, the writer of Villainous 2018 Mad Cave uh, winner. And uh, like I said, we have an awesome double feature this week with awesome independent creators whose books are different but similar because they feature superheroes in the indie background. Uh, I'm about to bring out Mr. Adam Barnhart, who is the writer of Scout Comics' Shit Show. And uh, here is Mr. Adam. Adam, how are you doing today? Good. How are you? I am really good, brother. So, man, um, I feel like me and you have been talking back and forth for like a month now because you reached mm -hmm. out to us, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book is we made sure to order up on some ash cans. The book is coming nice. in December. But right. tell us a little bit about Shit Show and what the journey that readers can expect from that. Absolutely. So Shit Show is, um, as you said, it's a superhero book um, and it's set in an alternate on an alternate earth um, where there once was plenty of powered people, both heroes and villains alike. And throughout um, flashbacks in the story, you, you find out um, the earth no longer has those heroes or villains due to an event. Um, an event that has led our protagonist on the cover down a uh, very un Superman like path, even though he's essentially a, a walking demigod. You know, there he is, Richard McCoy, right there. Yep. Rich. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. There, there was heroes, there used to be heroes. Now there's not, and uh, not nowhere near as many. And the few that remain um, formed the Magnificent McCoys, which is a traveling circus. So tell me a little bit about the Magnificent McCoys. I've had a chance to read uh, issue one. Mm -hmm. Enough to share that. And uh, you meet most, if not all, of the Magnific Magnificent McCoys throughout that first issue as mm -hmm. well as some of the surviving members of mm -hmm. what once was. And tell us just a little bit about that. It, Man, um, before I let you go off on that, as I was reading it, right. and I hate to compare people's independent books to anything, but mm -hmm. it literally felt like an Elseworld superhero tale. Like, hey, this is mm -hmm. what would happen if everything went completely wrong in one of the universes that we know and love, you know? And so, right. so tell me about this world. No, that's that's pretty much exactly um, kind of the thought process behind uh, developing it, at least. You know, I wanted to tell a superhero story, um, but indie publishers don't really like superhero stories. Um, yep, you know, so they're just kind of mentioned that as right, well. There, I, there's some publishers that flat out refuse, you know, pitches or submissions involving that. So we had a make something that that caught their eye you know and bad superman's been done time and time again you know bad superman's now the the lead of uh the boys and it's yeah. one of the most popular tv shows right so we didn't want to do bad superman we wanted to do um very human superman that superman. couldn't live up to his expectations or he couldn't live up to the, the he couldn't reach the pedestal everyone set for him and even though he had no control over people's thoughts about him you know he's still taking it 
the hardest out of anyone. You know, he's not a bad dude. Um, so he just drowns his sorrows. I, I don't want to spoil too much, but that that's the protagonist, the make McCoys. Um, and again, that's kind of spoiler territory. That's kind of one of the, the recurring themes of the book is um, found family and, and things of that nature. I don't want to get into too many more details. Yeah, um, but yeah, I would yeah. guess found family is probably the, the best way to explain it. So talk to me. What, one thing that I thought was super unique um, was the whole circus um, idea. Mm. The whole, I mean, yeah, yeah I guess – in in any really what we have is robin and that has any circus tie ever in any super that's about it um but you take this to a whole nother level where it, it almost honestly i'm reading it and it kind of felt like an adult swim cartoon network like like vibe and i'm like man these are like you know this 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 circus prior to the events that lead to you know what will right. be the series um, felt really natural. I actually really like found myself like intrigued mm -hmm. by the McCoys and their their kind of um, for lack of a better show kind of freak show act that they had going mm -hmm. there. Where did that come from? Um, so it all started with Rich McCoy. You know, I I started developing him and how I wanted to see him as a character, um, and then the circus started kind of floating in um for a whole variety of different reasons one there's um you know there it's the one way you can still kind of be a hero in the world right is to provide at least entertainment to okay. the masses you know you can't uh take down villains or superpower baddies when the, there are none right so it's kind of that way but then circuses or carnivals are I don't know how to explain it, but I always say it's it's the right amount of fun and horror at the same time. This isn't a horror book, yeah. but if you look at circuses, you know, a freak show is kind of, you know, the, the right way to put it. You know, it's the happy music and it's the, the giggling on the the uh, the Ferris wheel or the games or whatever. But then you have um, a drifter working the rides and he forgot to ratchet in a bowl yeah. to Right, and the ride's about to fall <laughs> apart and crush everyone. And there's, you know, animals running about, and maybe there's a freak show set up. You know, it, it's this weird mix up of happy, eternal joy, but at the same time, you know, you look around and you're like, man, this is really weird and unsettling. You know, maybe there's a, a speaker or a record player that's broken and the, the music's not coming across right, and it gives that that freak show vibe to it. That, like, so that's eerie vibe. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where it, it, the story took off from there. It started with rich and then the, that's how the, the circus got involved because I figured that, um, one played into the title super, super well, cause it's yeah. a show of yes. course. <laughs> and then two, it, um, spoke to the, the content of rich's story arc. So, um, like you mentioned, it's kind of, you know, a superhero, uh, it's kind of a superhero tale in a way. Mm -hmm. So what were your, um, comic book motivate, like inspirations growing up? What were you reading? What was Adam at 12 and 16 reading and what kind of things that you may have read early on in your childhood kind of may have made their way into here? Um, always like Daredevil. Um, you know, it doesn't really get much better than, than Frank Miller's Daredevil. Absolutely. Um, that's kind of, I really like his, you know, structuring and his prose influences at the same time of, of comics. And Al Ewing did something very similar with his Rocket miniseries or limited yeah. series a while, not a while ago, that was a year or two ago. Um, so, so Frank, definitely an inspiration. Another, um, big thing, um, in terms of structuring and, and things like that, uh, with the world building and stuff, I, I would be, um, um, Jeff Lemire's Black Hammer, uh, is another significant influence. I, I really like how he structured that story and, and the same goes with Hellboy, you know, um, Mike does terrific things um, <laughs> where he he does this micro series, but he introduces several characters or maybe plot threads or something, you know, 
Um, and that's not resolved by the end of the book, but lo and behold, they pop up out of the blue 10 years later. And you're like, oh, yeah. man, okay. That's, that in the background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, th there's some of that in with this. You know, I it's a uh, – this first volume is a complete oh, – I just bumped my mic. This first volume is a complete story. Okay. But there are the the things in there, you know. I mean, Hollywood loves spinoffs. People love spinoffs and crossovers. <laughs> so there's, there's the characters or there's um, – quote unquote throw throwaway mentions, I guess, you know, should the desire pop up. A supporting cast of younger characters, you know, that mm -hmm. make up the McCoys. So I mean the, the possibilities are potentially endless. Right. Um, you know, whether no matter what happens to Rich. Mm -hmm. Uh but but like so um I like that you mentioned it's funny that you mentioned um Frank Miller, Jeff mm -hmm. Lemire, Black Hammer. Um, I did get a little bit of a, a Black Hammer vibe in the sense that it was superheroes, but we're making them feel more grounded because right. uh, Rich's problems, you know, I, I feel like this isn't a spoiler because, I mean, he's kind of showing right, right, it. Right. But alcoholism is kind of one of his mm -hmm. his issues. Right. Um, and that's that's a very uh, real thing for a lot of people. Was that part of like your your attempt to make him a real person, you know, as opposed to Superman, Superman, you know, the joke with Superman and the flash is they can't get drunk. So it's mm -hmm. like this guy, he, you know, does have a demon in a bottle for lack of a better term. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the, I think it's the, the one thing I, I found out or that clicked for me, at least when, when making this story was the one thing that would make him vulnerable. Um, I've given this away before, but you know, Rich is human. He's not, from um krypton or, or something like that you know he's Not he is of people. this earth he just so happens to uh have you know pretty much can't die um uh, invincibility in in the works and um you know if people like the book enough we'll eventually get to how he got powers and his lineage <laughs> and all that stuff um <laughs> yeah i think the um the the booze was just a, a very human way to do it you know it's it's the same thing with um drugs you know there there's an opioid pandemic going on um you know overeating anxieties all sorts of stuff everyone on the face of the planet has vices or ways to cope right and that's just kind of where i settled at least for rich um then again once again to uh kind of mesh in with the, the whole title of the book um is a, a big reason why i chose that yeah it, it, it fit as soon as i read it, i'm like okay i see where this mm -hmm. is all going um so scout does a really cool thing where they do, uh, for a lot of the titles especially they do the ash cans you know a couple yep. months before release and then you have your you know your release mm -hmm. I want to say these ash cans were in the retailer direct for like September. So what's it been like to have to promote this book? Um, you've been now promoting a book for what feels like, well, especially in pandemic time, what probably feels like ever, but yes. for at least six months and you still have uh, almost two months before issue one hits the shelves. Right. Uh, you pretty much summed it up, man. We have, it was announced. The whole book was announced in January, I think. And, and even before the announcement, I, I had our social medias ready to go. Um, I had a trailer cut and a voiceover actor come in and, and record some stuff. So it's been, I mean, by the time shit show number one is released, it'll be a full 11 months approaching a year before <laughs> it's released, right? Um it's, uh, it's a lot of work uh, promoting <laughs> a book, you know, it's, it's, Everything um, you see on Twitter um, of people saying how difficult it is to promote creator owned work. Um, it's all true. Um, this is my first published work, um, but I do have a background in marketing and digital media. So I was, I was like, man, it, it can't be that difficult. You know, <laughs> it can't be that difficult. Um, it is. It's a struggle, you know. Thankfully, scouts on board and getting a publisher on board does help significantly with contacts and distribution and, and retailers, you know, such as yourself. Um, so that is, that's a very um, good opportunity, but man, it's, it's 
difficult getting getting your name out there, you know, especially when <clears throat> this is a whole nother topic we could get in, but you know, the whole Kickstarter machine and, and you have people raising $1.4 million with Kickstarter and things of that nature. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's growing increasingly more difficult to, you know, the, the more these big names, um, get into mainly creator owned as opposed to, you know, writing big two stuff. Yeah. It, and, and talk to me a little bit about, you know, um, Stoney was a little different cause he was a winner of, uh, the talent search contest for mad cave, but I know scout typically, um, receives pitches actually from my understanding scout receives pitches all the time um but so what was that process kind of like for you and then what was the feeling like when you got picked up uh it's amazing <laughs> you know it's like oh shit they're actually they're at, they they want to do it man yeah um the pitch process started well over a year ago i i submitted i'm looking at the calendar i submitted Last September is when I sent the pitch in, you know, and that was six pages plus some covers and some um, character design work. And um, pretty much I, I did submit the first full script um, and then the outlines for the next two pages with it. Um, but, yeah, I just I, I met the, the whole creative team, Samir, Warnia and Justin um, all through social media. Um, oh. And we put together the, the pitch packet and submitted it just how submissions go through the, through the website. And then uh, it took like two months to hear back, I think. Um, but I heard back and now we are here a year later. It's yeah. uh, It takes a while. That's another thing, man. Everyone says it takes a while to make comics. I'm like, nah, it doesn't take a while. It does. <laughs> it does. It really it does. Takes, it takes a while, you know, and uh, – the whole industry was disrupted for the better part of what three or four months there earlier this year. Yes. Um, so that certainly didn't help matters yeah. at all. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's long, it's a long time. <laughs> so with, with that being said, um, what can we expect from shit show? It is, is it a five issue mini? And then you said like you, there's potential for more or how do you have it? Uh, it's three issue mini so i'm structuring it kind of you know in the the whole three act type structure um i have the main story i have a planned about 15 issues awesome um should should things go um all of them are three three issue three issue volumes. or whatever um and like i said there there are things here and there um that will lead to other stuff that I'm currently writing or in production on or, or whatnot. Um, we announced the New York variant or the New York exclusive last week, I believe. I was um, actually just going to ask you about that. Yeah, okay. and so that sold out pretty quickly. We, I think, have a couple coming our way. But yeah, what? Uh, how would that feel to get a New York exclusive done? Uh, good. It's surprising, man. I can't wait to get my comps in the mail whenever they come. Hopefully today or something. I don't know. No, I can't get wait to get my hands on it. Um, because it's the first time I'm um seeing the whole book in print, the whole first issue, and because of the delays and such, you know, it's um this exclusive is out two months ahead of schedule, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's a unique aspect, but we are uh, speaking of stories or characters introduced that could pick up elsewhere. We did throw in a short story um, with the exclusive on, on the back end oh. as well. So um, that's kind of a, uh, if you want to want to see it, I, it might be in the regular number one issue too. Um but as of now, yeah. there's there is a backup yeah. story in there that that there's, they can check out. Awesome. There's a backup story that is very not attached to the main story at all, and it's gonna uh, you people are gonna look at it and be like, "What the hell's yeah. going on? How is this attached <laughs> to Richard McCoy and the Magnificent McCoys?" Uh, but no, that is awesome. We are, uh, I believe, we uh, we ordered five copies of that. We ordered five of all of them. We love to support Scout, Scout, Mad Cave. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To us. So, um, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we'll get a chance to send a few over to you and get them signed and then people can, can get a signed copy here in the we, store. We can work on that for sure. Hey. But, uh, all right. So we got the book, uh, releasing in December. 
So mm-hmm. there's still time. Um, there's still time to get orders in through Diamond if you're a local comic shop outside of Central Florida. If you are shopping with us here in Central Florida, we order directly from Scout, so we get a little bit of extra time. But uh, you can order the book Shit Show Number One. Uh, we still have some ash cans left in store, and we will have some New York Comic Con exclusives, which are black and white, really nice covers. Um, the writer is Adam Barnhart. Mm-hmm. Adam, tell every I know we started your segment here with the elevator pitch, more or less, but tell people again what the book is and what they can expect for a three issue journey here with you. Uh, most simplest terms, it's about drunk carnies with superpowers. Um, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's very if you watch Shameless, it's very much in the 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 uh, vein of Shameless. Um, if Frank Gallagher and the rest of the Gallagher's had superpowers. Um, it's messy. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a good time. It doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, I, I definitely had a plenty of fun writing, and I hope people enjoyed as much. Um, people enjoyed reading it as much as I had writing it. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of shit show in a nutshell. <laughs> that is awesome. The book is shit show number one. Mm-hmm. Technically, what I'm holding in my hand yep. is a Nash can. We have a couple copies of that in store. The writer is Adam right here. And thank you so much, Adam, for being on the show. We will definitely um, follow up with you guys. This is now yeah. our 11th show, if I'm not mistaken. Very nice. So we've had tons of great independent creators, and our plan is yeah. once um, all their series end. To bring them back on and see how everything right. went and everything like that and see if there's sequels in the uh, mix. Yeah. So we will definitely yeah. see you hopefully uh, real soon. Actually, the book comes out in December. We'll probably see you again before the book comes out. <laughs> right, right, right. It uh, sounds like a plan. Thanks a lot, Adam. We awesome. appreciate it, man. We'll have the book here in store. That is Adam. Thank you so much, man. And this has been a special double feature episode of the Collective Spotlight Our plan moving forward is to hopefully uh, keep doing double feature episodes, especially when we have um, independent creators that are friends of the store like this. So uh, with that being said, the book, Shit Show, we have Ashcans in store now. You can order number one, add it to your poll. We also have Villainous number one by Stoney Williams. That will be on the shelves tomorrow, and we will see on both of these books if we can manage to get some signed copies for the store. I have been Danny Morales. Steven Spivak's been my producer. Brendan Boyle has been the owner of the store. And we thank you for watching us. We will be back tomorrow on all of our channels for the collective happy hour uh, $1 auction at 530. Thank you very much. and keep.